Well, it's good to see everyone on this beautiful sunny day. We can look at God's word together. Um, this this uh, this passage it it just for me this was a really enjoyable message to prepare. So if no one else gets anything out of it, I got something out of this this message. So it was good. It was excellent. It was really, really good. So, no, we want to look at this. Um, we want to look at God's word. We're looking at, we're starting Mark chapter 9, and this is the section on the transfiguration. And it just uh, boggles my mind how much information is in there. And I hope it serves you. But I want to pray before I even read the word. I want to pray and ask the Lord to uh, really affect us today in some way through his word. So let's pray. So Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace, the grace of your word in our lives, the, the uh, ability and the freedom to open up your word and to, to read it and expound upon it, to look at it and to, to apply it. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Help us to receive something today that will truly be a memorable event in our lives. Help us to receive something today that we can take with us as we leave this place, sensing your peace and your joy, sensing your power and your glory. I pray, Father, that you would help me to be able to communicate in a way that's clear, and that I wouldn't be a hindrance to your purposes. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at, at this. This is entitled A Glimpse, and what it is is a glimpse. Um, God gives a glimpse. He's done that here and there throughout biblical history, but not in this way before. And this is just an interesting, fascinating way of God showing his glory, showing who Jesus is. So we want to look at Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, and we're going to look at that, and then we'll, we'll see what we can get to serve us today. So let's read Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it comes with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things and how it is written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased it is, as it is written of him. So here we have a glimpse. We have a glimpse of something special. It's like a, a little hidden window in the midst of everyday life there's this little glimpse all of a sudden that opens up and you see something something special my main point 
is when we are led by Jesus, we will see him in new light and grow in our testimony and our perception of him. When we are led by Jesus, we will see him in a new light and grow in our testimony and perception of him. So we're going to kick right in here and see where we go. My first point, God leads us to see him and his kingdom more clearly. God is the one who leads us. Our perception is very limited. We have a limited perception. This world, especially the world, has a very limited perception. It is flawed. We live in a sinful world. But if we accept Christ as our Savior, if we accept that work of Christ, that giving of his life, that being nailed to the cross, dying for our sins, the spilling of his blood, and his raising from the dead, and we confess our sins, we're sorrow for our sins, then we're forgiven of our sins. And all of a sudden, our life is no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. Our life is his. But all of a sudden, something starts to open up. And what we see, it's Jesus' life that changed our lives so that we can serve him in a much greater way, that we can be affected all our lives by him. And we begin to see things differently. Things do not look the same. We perceive truth now. We see life in a different way with a perspective only God can give through his spirit. It's not the same perspective that Peter, James, and John had, but it's a perspective. In our passage, we have a major perspective adjustment in the life of these guys, a glimpse that is really an extension of what Peter was talking about in the last chapter. When Barrow was sharing with us last week and Peter was declaring that Jesus was the Christ, it says in verse uh, Mark 8, 28 and 29, and he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And Jesus said to him in verse 30, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Then he proceeds to tell the disciples about his suffering after that in that chapter. He proceeds to tell them about his suffering. And that's when Peter kind of jumps up and he rebukes Jesus. Because really, it went against. And we got to understand why. A lot of times we say, well, Peter's just this haphazard guy who doesn't like things. We are affecting. There's two viewpoints coming head to head here what Peter was brought up believing about the Messiah and who the Messiah really is. And they just went, bam, just like that. It went against his view. Jesus rebukes Peter back, and he rebukes Satan. And then Jesus gets very real with everyone, and he starts to get the disciples around him, and he gets the people around him as well. And he says, he says you know, if you want to deny yourself. You need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And all these outrageously eye-opening things, Jesus began to say to them. See, Peter sees the Messiah's dying is unaccept an unacceptable concept. That's the way he was brought up. That's the way he saw it. Jesus sees his death as necessary. And so you have that conflict. So then we go to Mark 9, verse 1, and he says, and he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Power. I want to see power. That would, be, that would be an incredible thing. You wonder what the disciples were thinking. Jesus was always coming up with things that caused them to think and reflect and wonder about, to evaluate their view of life. And this is why Jesus did. He wanted them to question what they were thinking and what their views were, what their perspective was, what the view of the world was. And Jesus said the kingdom is going to come in power. What does that mean? So... Verse 2, so six days later, after six days, Jesus 
took with him Peter, James, and John, and he led them. You know, this word led is only used one time in the book of Mark. He led them. Jesus didn't normally lead them. He took people, but he didn't normally lead them. It doesn't usually use that term. It's kind of an interesting term. It's, he knew, it means he, you know where you're going and you're leading them up to something. That's what the, the Greek means. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them high up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. He was transfigured. Now, we use this term, I preached on Romans chapter 12 not too long ago, and we usually saw this term. It's the same term that's used in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus changed he, his, his, the, the word metamorpho, which we get metamorphosis, we talked about that, which we always talk about butterflies, that kind of thing. Um, Jesus changed automatically. Our lives changed much more gradually. Ch he changed into another form is basically what that word means. He changed into another form or transformed or transfigured it, it's, it's also a word used for the word change. They could call it the Mount of Change, but it doesn't really have that full meaning. It just doesn't do it. It's different than change. It's, it's coming into something else. The kingdom of God is a miraculous, powerful thing and causes another form to happen that is not the way it is in this world. And that's the work that's going on in our lives. We're being transformed, but it's a slow process. In 2 Corinthians 8, or 3, 18, it says, And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're being transformed. It's a process. We haven't arrived yet. I know I haven't arrived yet, but we're becoming more like Christ. This is sanctification. This is the work of the Spirit in our lives and the working in us. But Jesus was transformed before their eyes. It was something that just happened. It was a miraculous thing. Jesus needed Peter, James, and John to see something, so he took them. The word take means he willingly, he desired to take them. It's some, something he was specific about. He wanted these three, and he took them with himself up there. Now, I think there are a few things that we can learn from this Jesus, that Jesus wanted them to see. And I want to kind of go over these really quickly. Um, uh, this, this is my perception. I haven't read a lot of other people on this, and you can, you know, throw me out later. But I, I believe that, in, first of all, Jesus was giving notice. He was giving, not his two-week notice, but he's giving a reality. Yes, I am the Son of God, and you better realize this now because this is going to take place. And here is my proof to you that this is going to happen. It was a literal having something real happen them so that they could see this, that something big was going to happen, that Jesus, who he said he was, this wasn't like a temporary thing that was going to take place. It, it was something big and eternal that was going to take place. His present condition was temporary. His purpose was eternal. And he wanted them to know that who Peter proclaimed him to be, truly was who he said he was. Now, he also wanted them to get together, I think, to push away some doubts. Now, you have a passage just before that where you have you know, Jesus sharing what was going to happen and all of a sudden Peter saying, I don't like what you're saying. 
you're wrong, that's not what's going to happen. And Jesus coming back, no, you're wrong, that's what's going to happen. And then they rebuke, he rebukes Satan on top of that. So you have this big turmoil that takes place in their lives. Peter rebukes Jesus, Jesus rebukes Peter, Jesus rebukes Satan. You get this big thing that's going on. And it's, it's almost like it's a, a counterattack. This, the purpose of this is like a counterattack on the doubts that may have risen up from all of this. I don't know about you, when, when, when I start to doubt, when doubts begin to come, I think you lose momentum. When there's some sort of thing that distracts you and you begin to start to wonder whether this is actually what it should be, you begin to start slowing down. You want to look at it a little more closely, maybe. You Maybe sometimes you want to say, now this isn't worth it, I'm going to change my direction. People do this with their walk with the Lord. They become distracted, the enemy lies to them, they start to build doubts inside them, and then be begin to slow down. They misread the signs. People want to give up. Jesus wanted to solidify with them what was going on. He didn't want them to wonder anymore. He wanted them to see this is what's going to happen because Jesus knew what they were going to be facing shortly. And he said, you need this. So the other thing he wanted to do is he wanted to prepare them for their part in the future. He wanted to prepare these three. Now these three Jesus has taken with him before, Jairus' house, don't tell anybody, but we're raising someone from the dead. You know, th these different things. He takes them, and he takes these three for a reason. It's not because they were his favorite. Okay, Jesus doesn't play favorites. It's not because he promotes cliques. That is not what it's all about. Jesus wasn't trying to build some sort of social status. He wasn't trying to hammer a wedge in between the apostles. They could do that on their own later on. Let's look at who they were. James, the first apostle to be martyred. How do you prepare for something like that? Jesus knew what had to be done. Peter, the one commissioned to feed the Lord's sheep and to begin the blending of Gentiles and Jews. How would he know what to do? Jesus knew what needed to be done. John, the one who would watch and he would suffer. Tradition says he was boiled in oil at one point, but he lived through it. He sees the future. He reads things. He's imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos for years. How would he handle that? Well, Jesus knew what to do. They needed to see this. Jesus needed them to have a glimpse You see, Jesus leads them to see the purpose of God more clearly. He's done that with us as well. He opened our eyes. We see the Lord Jesus in a new way. If you would have asked me when I was 15 what I thought of Jesus, I wouldn't really have an opinion. If you ask me 50 some odd years later, I've got a very strong opinion about who Jesus is. Jesus opened my eyes to the gospel. He gave me assurance, faith. He gave me the grace to live my life. He gave me the word of God so I could see it and grow and learn from it. I saw Jesus truly as the Son of God. Jesus leads us to see his kingdom more clearly. Let's look at the second point. The Lord leads us also to listen to him. The Lord leads us to listen to him. Just like Peter or Jesus took Peter, James, and John to listen, he has taken us to listen. He has given us ears to hear, hearts to respond. You know, I don't know about you guys, but when it's very... When we're in big, big meetings or gatherings or something like that, and, and Roxanne wants my attention, it's very hard, isn't it, to get my attention? And so, even, this happens, 
this happens in a lot of places. And, and this is not a, a slam on Roxanne, it's, it's me. And she'll go, Dave. And I'll just be doing what I'm doing. She'll go, Dave. And somehow the, the decibel level gets higher <laughs> and, and all of a sudden it kind of catches me and I go, oh, what? You know, I didn't know she, 15 times she said my name. And, you know, finally I caught on. It takes a little extra effort sometimes to get somebody's attention. Jesus is taking Peter, James, and John to this place to communicate something to them to get their attention and to get their attention fully and solidly and get them truly behind what is happening here. Something no one else is going to be able to see or hear in this way. You can't reenact this. You can't use artificial intelligence to do it, to bring it about. This is the main event for the day. And it's the adjustment they needed for their whole life. This was their adjustment. So Jesus gets their attention. He changes into something different. He's transformed. And two other people show up. Moses and Elijah show up and they're talking to Jesus. They have Elijah, who the, the, symbolizes the significance of the law or the prophets. And you have Moses who symbolizes the law. You have the law and the prophets represented there. Neither of them, this is the interesting part, neither of them had normal deaths. Elijah was taken up and Moses' body was taken away by God. And they show up and they're talking to Jesus. Luke's gospel says, kind of alludes to what they're talking about. And it says they're talking about his, his exodus, his leaving, his, his resurrection. And that's what they're talking about, his departure. The Greek word <laughs> refers to his departure. And Peter, James, and John, this is, this is a fascinating part. Peter, James, and John know who these people are. They know who they are. Oh, this is, this is Moses and Elijah, along with Jesus. That's fascinating. That gives you a glimpse into the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't have to introduce them. Oh, I'd like you to meet two friends of mine. You know, they've been hanging around a long time. This is Moses and Elijah, you know. This is, this is something, this is a spiritual thing that's going on here it's an incredible thing it's not a it's not a conference it's not a spiritual conference where everybody has name tags don't you hate those name tags at a conference yes you go along i like the fact that they wear them down here now but that's that's all right but you go around like this who am i what's their name and you're just kind of wandering around like this could we could we suggest at the next pastor's conference could we have the name written on our foreheads? I think that would be, unless there's a transfiguration, and then we know everybody's names. I don't know. But there weren't name tags. They knew. They knew who Moses and Elijah were. It was a God-given new, if you want to call it that. It was a God-given new. I mean, Moses, when you think about this, you, you, Moses was the hero of the Jewish people, the historical hero of the law, the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. He was, he was just this incredible person. And you have Peter standing there saying, this is Moses. Not Taylor Swift, it's Moses. And they're just going to be excited about this. This is, this, is, this is dumbfounding. So when something like this takes place, you get a reaction. I mean, it's just going to happen. You're going to get a reaction. And it says here that the disciples were terrified. They were terrified. The Greek here means scream like a little girl. That's, no, that's not what I mean. It means that they were 
stricken with fear or terror exceedingly. They were terrified. This wasn't a boo scare like, gotcha. You know, this was, they were terrified. I looked up the physical symptoms of terror. I thought I should look this up to find out what, what happens to the physical body. It's an increase of heart rate. When you're, when you're in a state of terror, there's an increase of heart rate, faster breathing or shortness of breath, kind of like before I get up to give a message. There's butterflies and digestive changes. There's sweating and there's chills and your muscles start to tremble. This was all going on. You know, because they were terrified. But they didn't run. A lot of people will run when something like that happens. But here's their response. James and John say absolutely nothing. They say absolutely nothing. They have nothing to say. But Peter has a thought. Peter has a thought. And Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tents for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But this is the verse that's interesting. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Many have tried to explain why he suggested this. It's saying he did not know what to say. That's why he suggested it. Just firstly and popped into his head. Let's camp out. Let's settle down. Let's have a retreat. I got name tags. You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> Some say, you know, they want, he, he was saying, hey, let's stay here. I, I love this one. Stay here and bask in the glory of God. That sounds good to me. It's an attempt to honor people. Say so he's attempting to honor them. And Billy, and I think he was. But the bottom line, it was an awkward statement. He did not know what to say. He was terrified. He could have said, hey, guys, I'm hungry. I'm going to Chick-fil-A. You want anything? Would have been the same thing. Has nothing more than that. Didn't matter what he said. The point was that Jesus brought them up there for a reason, and it was to see. It was to see it. He wanted to get their attention. I think he got their attention. Then he also, in verse 7, he wants them to listen. He wants them to listen. Verse 7, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Overshadowed means it's something that cast a large shadow. It doesn't necessarily mean the cloud enveloped them or anything like that, but the cloud cast a shadow. It blocked the sun. It came around them. It was another, another frightening thing for them. It got their attention. It's almost like Jesus brought them up there and said, listen, you know, you won't believe me. I'm going to have my dad talk to you. That's, that's almost kind of like what it's going to be. This is what God says. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen means attend to, consider, understand, and perceive by listening. In other words, make an effort here. God wants to make an effort. You've got to listen. You've got to be deliberate. You've got to make an effort. This isn't, hi, I'm Jesus' dad. You're doing a great job down there. Thanks for your support. It was, this is my beloved son. Listen. Listen to him. And then all of a sudden, Everything's back to normal. Everybody's gone. Jesus is there. The disciples are there. And they're looking around. But the greatest truth and the most practical advice one could ever receive is for God the Father to say, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. You know, the Lord wants us to take this to heart. This isn't just for Peter, James, or John. This is... This was supposed to be reported to everyone so we would see it as well and listen to it and we would take this to heart. It's more than a religious belief. It's more than a philosophical theme statement on our Christian life. It's more than an old wives' tale that it happened. It's something Peter, James, and John were never to forget. And it affected their lives, the rest of their lives. And it's written here so we won't forget as well. 
This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Let's look at the third point. When we see God in a new light, we're different. When we see God in a new light, we are different. We are changed. There's something that happens in us. He's brought change in us in how we see life, how we relate to people. We're changed in how we see God himself. Understanding that Jesus came, what he came for and what to accomplish, to battle that, to overcome and to battle and defeat sin and death. And that he is coming again. His preparation for that. Understanding you won't need name tags in heaven. That's something we can get out of this. And the whole biblical puzzle begins to come together. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. And they were coming down the mountain, and he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, but they were questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. There was an acceptance of what Jesus said to them. Don't say anything about this. Don't say anything about what you've seen. This is something that is is between... God, you, me, and Moses, and Elijah, until the Son of Man is returned from the dead. Then you can tell everybody. You can just let everybody know what happened. They weren't to tell about it until after the resurrection. And they kept the matter to themselves. They were faithful, but they questioned, what's this raising from the dead thing? must have been hard That kind of an experience, and you're not able to tell anybody. Can you imagine keeping that inside all this time? And I'll bet you, as soon as the resurrection happened, Peter, James, and John got together and said, who do you want to tell first? This is something we got to tell somebody. In 2 Peter 1, verses 16 through 18, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, it says. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. John refers to it as well, John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I think after all this happened, when they're going down the mountain, I, I begin to think that As soon as they saw this, they saw everything in a new light. And even their questions to Jesus were a little different. How they related to Jesus was a little different. See, the idea of the Messiah dying, that's a a foreign, such a foreign concept. That's a paradigm shift. Like uh, any, you talk to any Jew about that, that's troublesome to to them. Um, and they're coming down the mountain, and uh, there's got to be a lot of thoughts marinating in their heads. There's just got to be a lot of things going on. And we get verses 11 through 13, and they asked him, these are the questions, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased. It is written of him. Elijah must come first. The Jews at a Passover... I don't know if, if I suppose it depends on the sect of the Jew, but Jews at a Passover, they have a, a place setting for Elijah, mainly in most cases it's a, it's a cup of wine set aside for Elijah, and also they leave the door open. 
because it's a sign of hope. It's a sign of, it's a positive thing. They want, they want Elijah to come to their house and drink their wine, and, and they know that Elijah has come, and after Elijah comes, then the Messiah will come. So it's a very positive, it's a very uplifting thing, and it's done during the Passover, and the Passover has, you know, just a mixed emotions because it's deliverance from Israel, but they're, or Egypt, but they're also remembering all the difficulties they had in Egypt and all the preparation that had to take place there. But Jesus says, yes, Elijah does come first, and Jesus once again gives perspective. Both Elijah and the Messiah are coming. He's telling them that. But both will be suffering and treated poorly. That's a whole... But I think Peter and James and John now, because of the transfiguration their perspective was changed, and they could say, okay, okay, I think I see this now. It's part of the plan, Jesus is saying. This is part of the plan to save mankind, because mankind is lost. Mankind is going to hell. Don't look at what the scribes say about this. This is their traditions. Don't look at what they're saying about it. Look at it biblically and prophetically. Biblically, reality is sometimes very harsh, sometimes very joyous, but it's always truth. He was trying to encourage them to do this. In closing, it was, it was an amazing glimpse of the things to come. Jesus in his glory and Peter, James, and John were to be the mouthpiece that they would always have would remember this experience and they're to be the mouthpiece of this. This is a testimony. This is a testimony of what happened to them. We have a testimony. Each one of us has a testimony. Each one of us who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior has had a little glimpse in that testimony and we're to be a mouthpiece of the glory of God. And you'll always have that experience to look on. You know, peace and vision and direction, these things come from God. And there's a statement that we have to remember and we have to keep this in mind. And I think, really, and I think we need to pray about this, we need to keep that reality of what Peter, James, and John were told. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for making, making things clear in your word to the disciples by shifting how they viewed life. Lord, there are many things in our lives when we're walking each and every day and we are seeing things we like, seeing things we don't like. We are grabbing onto things we like that we shouldn't we are rejecting things that we should grab onto. Lord, there are so many things in this world and it's because we get so inundated by what the world says, by what the traditions are, by what's socially acceptable. Lord, we need to come down to the, the basic truth that Jesus was your son and we're to listen to him. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Help it to go with us as we walk out our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.